very glad to see you all here. It's really, really great to be back. And what I want to actually start off with is celebrating how much science has already achieved. There's quite a lot that we should be proud of. You know, we've made it over to the moon, conquered the depths of the oceans. We even have a pretty good understanding of how the whole universe works, from subatomic particles to the entire galaxies. But what we still actually still struggle with is understanding our own human mind, perhaps the last big frontier and the toughest challenge ahead of us in science still. The brain is the most complex organ we have in the human body. It has as many neurons as there are stars in the Milky Way, and they form million new connections between themselves every second. And in many ways, our own brain is much deeper than any of our oceans. So even if our working methods evolved to be able to handle this complexity, I'm sure we would all agree that looking at people as some sort of sum of neural pathways is not going to tell us the whole story. We're, we're much more than a mathematical model of neurons. We're much more of a collection of our thoughts and feelings. But how to measure and analyze that human aspect in a practical way is a challenge that we're still working on. Now, here's a bit of a personal story because this measurement and analytics has always been my thing. Ever since I was a very small kid, I was uh, fascinated by data, facts and figures of, of all kinds. And the two favorite books that I had in my life was an atlas and an encyclopedia. And what I immensely enjoyed doing was just going through that and categorizing the size of different um, rivers and islands and writing it down in my notebooks. So if you ever know of a geekier thing what a child could really enjoy, I'd love to talk to you over the <laughs> coffee break, really. But why on earth did I do that and love doing it? I think, I guess I always believed there's something really solid about data, so some sort of inherent promise of truth that really, really captivated from me from the very beginning. So you can imagine my disappointment then when I followed the numbers to my uh, very first job as a fund manager. So I was actually really excited. It's finally I was going to work on real big numbers that would have real impact, but that excitement waned pretty quickly as I realized that the numbers that I worked with every single day, they were comparably pointless to the stats notebooks that I wrote up as a child. My uh, Excel sheets with asset allocation numbers were just cold numbers. They didn't have much of a story behind them, and their impact on any people's lives was very limited. So that's how I came to Oxford. Um, literally to to find a more meaningful way to, to work with data and analytics. And it was here where I came across the idea, that even the possibility that we could measure what people feel or what really captures their attention. And I immediately realized that that, that human data was exactly what I was looking for. So for me, human data really means two things. There's like solid numbers and analytics on one hand, and then a promise of a deeper meaning on the other. And that's what emotion measurement for me takes on both sides because it can tell us a lot about real people and it really can have all sorts of impact on different activities that we people do. So what do I mean by emotion measurement? Well, the way we people feel is actually quite visible in our reactions and, and, and behavior. Facial expressions, for example, will re can reveal directly many of our main emotions, as you can see here on the screen. And what, what we're able to do now these days, using the latest advances in computer vision and machine learning, is to pick up those physical cues and understand what people feel via absolutely any internet-connected webcam. So phones in your pocket, the laptops that you work with, they're all good enough for that. So this tech. The webcam tech is really new, it's really leading edge, but it, what, it actually builds on more than almost two centuries of research because it was Darwin 
was the very first in his 1872 book of the expression of emotion in man and animals to make the argument that some of the emotions that we have, they're biological. It's not something that we learn in our lives, but they're literally built into us uh, when we're born. So you can think of unborn babies smiling on x-ray scans or, or, or blind people having the very same facial expressions as all of us, even though they never saw another person in their life. So this idea, initial big idea, was picked up by uh, psychologist Paul, Paul Ekman in the 60s, and he went on to create a facial action coding system. It's now been a de facto standard in psychology for decades, which basically categorizes any possible expression that a human face can make and concluded also in his studies that there are six, the same emotions that were flicking over before, which are the universal and the same for all of us. So it doesn't matter where we come from, how old we are, the way people are happy or surprised is the same in Japan, Madagascar, or Iceland, for example. And the great thing is that the webcam technology is even growing beyond those six basic emotions now. Computers can already understand our attention level, they can even read our heart rate just from the tiny change of color of your skin. And soon enough, they'll be able to understand most of the complex body language and understand if we're bored, excited, or tired. So why is that important? Well, I actually want to ask you a question. How many, question. how many decisions do you think you actually really logically, rationally think through? I think, you know, we, we'd like to think that we're thorough and, and, and it would be like most of them. But I have to tell you that's not true. It's, it's just too much to handle. We, ha we do too many things every day. And it's now a well-established fact that oh, well over 90% of our, our thoughts and decisions are actually driven by subconscious instead. And that's perhaps the biggest challenge that, that business in general is facing, is how do you account for that human dimension and, and, and build for that. And that's what emotion measurement can help with and start to pave the way for better services around us, which I believe will be key to solving many, many inefficiencies in, in, in several industries. So uh, let's take advertising, for example. There's pretty polarized views between people of that whole concept of what advertising is, but. The case is that people do not hate advertising, they hate bad advertising, which really just interrupts their daily days with boring and irrelevant messages. On the other spectrum, people can actually really love advertising. If it's really super funny or touches you very deeply, they will go as far as to share it with their very best friends or family. So that's one scenario where this kind of general emotional intelligence can come into play because if you understand what content for what people is annoying or exciting, you can use that to align the audiences and the advertisers and take out all the friction and waste that there is in this process today. The implications and the applications of emotion measurement take a well beyond marketing. So let's take education, for example which is already being assisted by different types of software. But th that software could perform so much better if it had the same emotional understanding of the individual that the teacher has in the classroom scenario. Or personal health, which is already enjoying a huge boost from all sorts of fun quantified self apps. But instead of how many miles you ran or how many calories you burned, these fun apps can and will tell you about your mental health, your stress and happiness levels, and how to, how to maximize and optimize those. So the broader point here is that as big data and machine learning are entering our daily lives more and more, data-driven decision-making in everything, literally from your job application, from a credit score, from dating people, from health, well-being, in everything is becoming the new default. And that's happening whether you like it or not. But what we can change in the effect is how much will we take into account of the human dimension in those uh, algorithms. Because if you feed it with the right data, 
they will give us better and fairer decisions in all of those things. So where the technology is today, it really just works over large sets of audiences and, and aggregates data across that. But ultimately, it's all about individual, you, the user, and understanding exactly your feelings and reacting to that in real time and offering you what really works for you. So imagine a scenario that you're just watching a movie and you're in a mood for a good ending, happy ending in the movie. Content will actually be smart enough to, to understand that and, and offer that ending that really does it for you and understanding your preferences. <laughs> or take another scenario when you had a really, really bad day and you just want to be left alone. And bang, every ad disappears from all of your screens and your Spotify turns on your peace and tranquility playlist. One size no longer fits all. I mean, we all know technology has been driving personalization for, for a while already, but with human data in that mix, the recommendations we will get are much better and it will put us, the consumers, much more in control to get things that we actually really want and need. So you can think of that as a uh, sort of an internet that understands body language, much like we people do, because a lot of our communication is nonverbal, and today not much of software understands any of it. But emotion, the emotion measurement is already filling that gap, and when it really gets going on scale, we're all in a better place to enjoy much more smarter and enjoyable services around us, even beyond those education and health scenarios I already mentioned. So I started very positive with observing how much we already know about space and, and oceans. But I want to end even more positive because now we know so much more about ourselves also. Emotion measurement is becoming really helpful in quantifying that human aspect of us better than ever before. And as the data-driven decision-making is becoming a part, bigger part of our daily lives, it's really the bottom time to do more of it. I see feelings management becoming a normal part of our daily lives pretty fast. And I'm confident that rather than its potential for manipulation, it will put us, the consumers, in a much more stronger control over our own life quality. There's a, one quote I want to share about that point. I uh, came across that seven years ago. I was, uh, it was in a, some random village in, in Cyprus. I was uh, on a trip over there straight after I was finishing the course here in Oxford. And I was um, thinking about that whole uh, emotion measurement stuff pretty heavily back then. So that's what I came across. Our life is not measured by how many breaths we take, but by the moments that take our breath away. We're all here only for that amount of time, so let's make the most out of it. The emotion aware internet and all the software on top of that that I was speaking about is going to be a very solid building block that will help us all find and experience more of those breathtaking moments. So imagine the impact that it will have on impact could have on humankind if we could double the amount of those meaningful moments for absolutely everybody on the planet throughout their whole life. That's exactly what I see will happen in our lifetimes, and that's why I'm so super excited to be part of this, pushing this field forward. Thank you.